All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, this is Lauren Wenzel from the National Marine Protected Area Center. I'm happy to welcome you all to the webinar series sponsored by the MPA Center and EBM Tools and Open Channels. This is part of our series on MPA networks and MPAs. And today we're very happy to have Sarah Hutto with us. She is the Ocean Climate Initiative Specialist at the Gulf of the Farallones National Marine Sanctuary, and she is coordinator of the Sanctuary's Clim Climate Smart Adaptation Project. I'll be introducing her a little bit more in a minute, but um, what I wanted to do first is just let you know that um, Sarah is going to be presenting and for about 40 minutes, and then the last 20 minutes or so will be Q&A, and we urge you to go ahead and type in your questions in the webinar interface um, into the question box, and then we can go ahead and tackle those questions at the end. So please go ahead and do that if you have questions as we go ahead and go through the, uh, the presentation. Um, so Sarah has a science background in kelp ecology, and she's been working in marine resource management for two and a half years. And today she is going to be talking about the development of the first comprehensive and prioritized adaptation plan within the California coast and ocean-based uh, climate smart principles. So Sarah, welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lauren, for that introduction. Um, I'd also like to mention that we have on the line Kelly Higgison, and she's the coordinator of our ocean climate program at the sanctuary as well as Maria Brown. She's the superintendent at um, Gulf of the Farallones National Marine Sanctuary. And so you may be hearing from them later on um, during the Q&A session. They'll be online to kind of help me answer any questions you may have. All right, so to get started, since this is um, a webinar series focused around MPAs, I just wanted to um, kind of go over some of the benefits that um, exist in addressing MP, uh, climate change in MPAs. Um, just the nature of MPAs being long-term and very place-based, this provides a great focal point for science and monitoring. Um, and this information can in turn be really helpful in this sort of um, adaptation planning process. The public is often already engaged and involved in these areas, um, as are the partners in the area. And so there's a lot of um, activity and support that can be leveraged there. Um, protected areas also reduce other stressors that can exacerbate climate change. So being able to address climate change in these um, more protected areas can be really beneficial. And um, protected areas often serve as sentinel sites. And for our region specifically, we um, are a partner, a participating partner of the NOAA Sentinel Site Cooperative Program. And because of that, we're able to corral resources to really tackle um, coastal problems. So again, leveraging of um, pre-existing resources and partnerships can be really beneficial in this sort of adaptation planning process. And so to, to introduce you to our marine protected area that we're operating in, um, this is Gulf of the Farallones National Marine Sanctuary. And we were designated in 1981. Our current boundaries are around 1,300 square miles. And you can see the current boundaries kind of in the darker shaded green area on that map, um, basically right off the coast of San Francisco. We surround the Farallon Islands. Um, but proposed expansion would actually add around 2,000 square miles. And so we're going through that um, proposed expansion process right now. And you can see the lighter shaded green area um, is where we would be expanding to, so basically up the coast. Um, our current boundaries encompass open ocean, tidal flats, rocky intertidal, estuarine wetlands, subtidal reefs, um, and beach habitat. And we also serve as breeding and feeding grounds for 25 endangered and threatened species, 36 marine mammal species, um, over a quarter million breeding seabirds, and one of the most significant white shark populations on the planet. And so before I get into the specifics of our adaptation project and um, kind of what we're looking to accomplish, I wanted to give just a brief background on the climate program that we have at the sanctuary, because I think it's a really unique um, program and really effective. It was founded in 2008 by Kelly and Maria, who are the two that um, are going to be joining us for the Q&A later. And um, as a climate program, one of our main goals is to bring together partners and um, practitioners in the area 
every two years we hold an ocean climate summit. We've held three so far. Um, a big portion of this program is also um, to coordinate our Climate Smart Conservation Program, which I'll be talking about shortly. And we're also uh, participating partners for multiple collaborative projects in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area region, including the Our Coast, Our Future Sea Level Rise tool, um, which really helps managers to understand the potential future impacts of sea level rise. The California King Tides Initiative is a citizen science project that encourages folks to go out and take photos of the highest high tides and um, use those photos, share those photos, and outreach for us, to, for the public to understand what um, sea level rise may look like in their, in their backyard, basically. So we're a participating partner for that program. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are a member of the San Francisco Bay and Outer Coast Sentinel site. And we're also a founding member of the Bay Area Ecosystems Climate Change Consortium. So to get into our Climate Smart Conservation Program, this is really um, the focus of the climate team at the sanctuary. And really what we're, we're looking to do is to integrate climate change into every aspect of sanctuary management. And so um, what that looks like is considering climate change in our um, activities at the sanctuary, so through mitigation, through science and monitoring, through adaptation, which will be the focus of today's talk, and finally, um, through our communication. And so just briefly to touch on each of these, um, after founding the Ocean Climate Initiative in 2008, staff have reduced uh, the sanctuary's carbon footprint through our green operations plan. We've worked with local scientists to develop a comprehensive report on the impacts that we can expect to see in our region. Um, and this impacts report has been really, really helpful and has served as the, found, the science foundation for our adaptation work here. More recently, we've developed physical and biological indicators that provide important information about the status and trends of climate change impacts in our region. And then for the next year or two, um, we're shifting our focus to developing, developing these adaptive management actions. So with all this information we've been able to gather on what we expect to see um, through climate change in our region, we want to turn that now um, more into action. And so to develop these adaptive management actions to address climate change. And eventually we hope to spend a little more time um, developing project specific communication strategies and education programs as well. And so um, before I get into our adaptation project, I just wanted to introduce the term climate smart adaptation. Um, climate smart is a term that's definitely being used more and more, but I want to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page about you know, what we mean when we say climate smart adaptation. Basically, we're looking at strategies that promote nature-based solutions to, one, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and enhance carbon sinks, two, reduce climate change impacts on wildlife and people and enhance resilience, and three, sustain vibrant and diverse ecosystems. In a few real-world um, examples of climate smart adaptation from our region, um, climate smart is meant to be future-focused, it's meant to operate in an ecosystem context and, of course, be very adaptive and flexible. And so a couple examples of that include um, the modification of nest boxes on the Farallon Islands by Point Blue Conservation Science in order to alleviate heat stress as extreme heat events are becoming more prevalent in our region. Also, the restoration of um, habitats, in this, in this case um, streams, to accommodate um, the increasing variability we're seeing in temperature, precipitation, and extreme events by planting a greater diversity of species that are more tolerant to those variable conditions. Climate Smart is also, um, it also prioritizes actions. It's highly collaborative and is often stakeholder-led. And of course, like any planning process, it's um, very iterative. Um, and there are you know, prescribed steps that, you, that are helpful to follow in this type of planning process. Um, but it, 
never um, as nice and neat as this beautiful little circle of action you see here. Um, you're always going back and revising and um, changing things depending on uh, what you're learning throughout the process. And so the basic adaptation planning process that we followed um, you can, is kind of distilled down in this figure. Um, the first is really to identify what you want to focus on. And we've been referring to those as our focal resources. Um, and we've been categorizing those as species, habitats, and ecosystem services. Here they're labeled as conservation targets. Um, once you kind of know what you're focusing on, you then want to assess how vulnerable those things are to climate change. Um, and from there, once you kind of have that information built up, you can then identify management options to hopefully, hopefully reduce that vulnerability. And then you move on to the implementation stage. Um, and of course, then you want to monitor how effective those actions are, possibly go back and um, review and revise some of your strategies um, along the way. And of course, in the beginning, it's very important to develop a clear and well thought out goal um, at the outset. And of course, you'll likely be revisiting this goal and changing it um, throughout the process. And so this is the goal that we've developed for our Climate Smart Adaptation Project. Um, and it is lengthy, but it's very important to kind of get down in writing so everyone understands really where you're headed and what you want to accomplish. So our goal for this project is to protect and maintain healthy ecosystems by enhancing the resilience of species, habitats, and ecosystem services to the impacts of climate change through collaboratively developed adaptation actions that are feasible, effective, and nature-based. And so the scope of the project um, is not just restricted to the current boundaries of Gulf of the Farallones National Marine Sanctuary. Um, the scope of the project expands up to cover um, all of that proposed expansion area for both Gulf of the Farallones and Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuaries, as well as the northern portion of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which is managed by Gulf of the Farallones. And so it ranges from Año Nuevo and San Mateo County in the south, which is basically just in between San Francisco and Santa Cruz, um, up to Alder Creek and Mendocino County in the north. So um, it's a very large area. You can see that it covers three national marine sanctuaries, but it also includes two national parks and a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuge, which is the Farallon Islands themselves. And so what we're really looking to accomplish with this project is to answer these two really big questions. The first is how vulnerable to climate change are the species, habitats, and ecosystem services that we manage here on the North Central California coast? And we're hoping to be able to answer that question in phase one of our project, or the vulnerability assessment phase. Um, the second question we're looking to answer is, with that information, what can we then do to limit or reduce the vulnerability of those resources? And this will be addressed in a, the second phase of our project, or the adaptation planning phase. And I do want to take a moment to mention that we have a very dynamic team of partners that are either providing expertise as part of our project planning committee, um, financial support for this project, or both. And we're very thankful to the California Landscape Conservation Cooperative and the National Park Service for providing funds to accomplish phase one. Um, and the LCC has also committed funds for us to um, complete the project um, by funding phase two. And so we're very grateful for that funding in order to, to do this. Um, the other partner I'd like to call out specifically is EcoAdapt. They have been um, consulting on this project. Uh, they're really the experts in adaptation. And many of you may already be familiar with this group. Um, they're very active in the climate change and climate adaptation community. And they've really developed the materials and the methods for vulnerability assessments that you'll be learning more about in this presentation. So I definitely want to give them um, the recognition because we certainly would not have known how to tackle this um, without their help. And so looking back at that um, cycle of adaptation planning, the way we've tackled this is to kind of divide it into two phases. The first, as I mentioned earlier, is our vulnerability assessment phase. And the second is our adaptation planning phase. 
And right now we're in the thick of the vulnerability assessment. So that will be um, really the focus of this talk, and I'll be able to show some preliminary results as well, which is pretty exciting. And because our study region is much larger than um, just our sanctuary boundaries, we didn't want this just to be an internal process of, of gathering information. And so we decided to tackle the vulnerability assessment phase um, by bringing together two workshops of folks to kind of help us to um, gather the information we need to then move on to adaptation planning. And so we um, had two decision support workshops this year. The first um, we're calling our focal resources workshop was in February. And this workshop brought together 30 scientists, managers, and policy experts representing 21 institutions, organizations, and agencies. Um, and their goal was to recommend to us those species, habitats, and ecosystem services in the study region that they felt we should be addressing in this project. They produced those recommendations um, in habitat breakout groups, and they ended up uh, recommending to us 53 species, nine ecosystem services, and 10 habitats. We then took a look at that list um, internally and through our project planning committee and realizing that um, in all likelihood it was a very ambitious number of resources to assess um, in the follow-up workshop, we decided to whittle that down as much as possible. Um, and then beyond that, allow the workshop participants to kind of prioritize which species they wanted to assess um, first to determine um, how many they'd be able to get through, basically. And so we ended up with uh, 42 species, 8 ecosystem services, and 8 habitats. Okay, and then so for the follow-up vulnerability assessment workshop, this was over two days in June of this year. And the goal here was to then assess the vulnerability of those selected focal resources to climate and non-climate um, related impacts. And this workshop brought together 35 participants, um, representing 25 different organizations. And again, they worked in habitat breakout groups to assess each resource's sensitivity to climate and non-climate impacts, each resource's exposure to those impacts, as well as each resource's ability to adapt to change. And I'll go through those components of vulnerability here shortly. And so of, of that list of final resources, um, they were able to get all of the habitats assessed, which was great, because that's kind of the course level filter, um, the more encompassing um, category of resources. So we really wanted to get all of those assessed. They were able to get 18 species assessed at the workshop, and then I followed up with folks um, later on to get 10 additional species assessed. And then they assessed six of the eight um, ecosystem services. And so to kind of dive into um, vulnerability and what it means, um, basically the, the definition of vulnerability is the extent to which a species, habitat, or ecosystem service is susceptible to harm from climate change impacts. And so it's um, in, a sense, in a sense quantitative, we have this very simple equation that's taking into account those three components of vulnerability to produce a final um, relative vulnerability score. And so what vulnerability assessments can really um, help us do is help us to prioritize species and habitats and ecosystem services for management actions. Um, because all of us have very limited resources, we need to know uh, which, which um, focal resource, which species in our, in our sanctuary we should really be um, focusing on. And not only does this help us to prioritize and develop those management strategies, but this process can help us to more specifically target the actual mechanism that is being identified as causing a particular species vulnerability. So we know um, kind of which problems to tackle that might make an impact. And so basically this is just another tool as managers for us to efficiently allocate our resources if we really want to make a difference um, when it comes to climate change impacting our, our marine protected area. But of course, vulnerability assessments cannot make those conservation decisions for you. Um, it's just another tool for us to use. 
And so to then go through those components of vulnerability, um, the first is really the most straightforward. It's um, exposure. And this is a measure of how much of a change in climate or other environmental factor a resource is likely to experience. And so this is where we bring in projections for future changes to our climate, including um, air and sea temperature, sea level, ocean chemistry, um, precipitation, erosion, lots of different climate factors that we're looking at. Um, and we want to determine which of these factors a resource may be exposed to. This, of course, doesn't take into account what that exposure means. Um, and that is covered by sensitivity, which is a measure of whether and how a resource is likely to be affected by a given change in climate. And so this pairs really with um, the exposure component, because if an individual is highly exposed to decreased pH, but it doesn't make a lick of difference on that individual's um, health or um, abundance, then it doesn't necessarily um, factor into their vulnerability. Of course, when we're looking at the impact of um, these climate-related and non-climate-related stressors, we're looking at direct and indirect impacts. So maybe the sea otter isn't impacted by decreased pH, but its prey likely are highly impacted by decreased pH. And so these are all things that we're considering when we're assessing vulnerability of our species um, and other focal resources. Some other things that are considered in the sensitivity score is whether or not a species is highly dependent on a sensitive habitat or um, a very specific prey item. And also, is this species a, more of a generalist, um, in which case they're going to be less sensitive? Or is this species more of a specialist? And then, of course, we're also looking at life history, so the reproductive strategy can um, definitely impact how sensitive a species is. If uh, we have a species that's long-lived and does not reproduce very often, um, then they're going to be more sensitive to those stressors and those impacts. And so then the final component of vulnerability is adaptive capacity. And this is the ability to accommodate or cope with climate change impacts with minimal disruption. And some factors that we consider here, um, when you're thinking about a habitat, we're looking at what's the geographic extent of this habitat? Is it isolated or continuous? Um, what's the integrity of the habitat? Is it pretty functional or is it highly degraded? Um, we're looking at how permeable the landscape is, um, how diverse the physical and topographical characteristics are in that habitat, as well as the level of diversity of the component species and functional groups. And then um, we also want to consider if people value the habitat, then um, technically its adaptive capacity will be higher because we'll be willing to do more to help. And um, what's the potential for us to be able to manage the impacts to that habitat? When you're considering species, a lot of it is similar. Um, what's the ex geographic extent of the species? What's the population status? Um, one consideration for species is its dispersal capability. Um, can it disperse long distances, or is it pretty limited in its, in its dispersal distance? Um, what's the diversity of the species in the sense of life history strategies, behavioral um, and phenotypic plasticity? It's how, you know, how can it vary its responses to environmental variation, basically? And then the same as habitats, we're looking at how valued this resource is and how easily managed this resource is. So looking back at our equation for vulnerability again, um, each resource at the workshop was scored for each of those three components of vulnerability on a one to five scale based on many of those characteristics I just listed. Um, these scores were then used to calculate an overall vulnerability score for each resource that is being incorporated into our final assessments. And so how we are developing these final assessments of vulnerability, of course, we don't just want to rely on a number that was produced by a small group of people um, when asking them about this resource. We want to back that up with um, robust background peer-reviewed literature. So you'll see our three components of vulnerability at the top. Um, and so we're taking into, into account the scores, 
that each resource received for those vulnerability components, as well as the narratives that provides us um, greater context um, and ability to kind of understand what the what the workshop participants were thinking when they gave a species a certain valued score. These narratives also um, take into account confidence. How confident were their ratings and their scores? And that will um, definitely matter when we're putting all this information together. And then, of course, we supplement those relative scores of vulnerability with information from the literature um, to come up with these vulnerability assessment reports that we're writing for each individual resource. And then those will go through a peer review process before those are finalized. And so now um, what I wanted to show is our preliminary results of these um, relative vulnerability scores for all of our resources. Um, these scores are definitely subject to change with subsequent peer review of the assessment reports and the incorporation of background literature. Um, but I love looking at graphs and figures, so I wanted to be able to show something of what we've been able to come up with. Um, and so I think it's really exciting to be able to share this with you. And so before I actually show the scores for habitat, just to orient you to kind of how this data is being visualized. Um, we have our three components of vulnerability. Adaptive capacity is on the y-axis, and it ranges from low adaptive capacity to high. Sensitivity and exposure are averaged on the x-axis, and that, again, ranges from low to high. And you'll see if a species or a habitat or ecosystem service has very low adaptive capacity and very high sensitivity and exposure to climate and non-climate um, stressors, it's going to be highly vulnerable. On the other hand, if a resource has very high adaptive capacity um, and very low sensitivity and exposure to those stressors, it will have a very low vulnerability. And so I do want to um, kind of put out the disclaimer that uh, the placement of, of the resources that you'll see on this figure is categorical, and so it doesn't reflect the raw scores. Um, and will be, this is really just a method for us to visualize the data when we're actually um, looking back at this information to help develop management strategies and to prioritize those resources, we'll be looking at those raw uh, vulnerability scores. So to start out with habitats, um, the first thing I noticed is there's really not much spread here in the um, adaptive capacity. They all ranked, all the habitats ranked about moderate or moderate high ability um, to adapt to change. On the other hand, there's, there's great spread in the sensitivity and exposure of, of habitats. And when you do look at the raw scores, um, the most vulnerable habitat that we had scored was beaches and dunes. And that was followed by um, estuaries and then by the rocky intertidal habitat. And <clears throat> so the first thing I notice about those three being the most vulnerable is that they're all um, coastal habitats that exist at the interface of land and sea. Um, and so it, it seems to me, just from this pre preliminary look, that they're maybe being hit with um, more, more climate impacts than some of the other habitats. Um, I'm going to take a second for you to kind of look at this before I start talking since there's a lot of information here. Um, and so these are all of our species. And I do want to point out we have two kind of lumped groups, and this is just because there's a lot of overlap in that these groups have very similar scores. Um, there were, of course, some subtle differences that we'll be looking at further as we move forward in the planning process. but. Um, we have a group of invertebrates that are lumped. Uh, you can see the composition of that grouping in the lower left corner. And then a group of bird species that were lumped. And you can see those species in the upper right corner. Um, again, the, the distribution here is pretty variable for adaptive capacity. Um, sensitivity exposure, everything was pretty much uh, two and a half or higher. And then what I thought was interesting was to call out, um, because we have about 30 species here, to call out the top third. Um, so these are the 10 most vulnerable species, according to the raw scores, the raw data um, 
and what's interesting is with the exception of the pteropod and the ashy storm petrel, all these species utilize our um, coastal habitat. And so um, it's kind of interesting to see that the habitat vulnerability results and the species vulnerability results are fairly similar in the fact that it looks like more of our coastal resources um, may be getting more of our focus as far as management prioritization. And so finally, our ecosystem services, um, which in general, these scored very high for sensitivity and exposure, and then um, didn't have much of a spread for adaptive capacity, of course, with the exception of the carbon storage ecosystem service. And again, those, um, the top three most vulnerable, which were carbon storage followed by um, flood and erosion protection, then followed by food production, um, are highly linked to our coastal habitat. Um, you could definitely argue that all of these ecosystem services are provided by our, by our coastal habitats as well, um, but particularly carbon storage stands out to me um, as tracking well with the results that we've seen for the other categories of focal resources. And so um, from these results that, again, are going to be um, supplemented with background literature and peer review, Really the next step of this project is to use that information to then develop management strategies that we hope will um, reduce vulnerability by either reducing the exposure or sensitivity of a resource to either climate or non-climate impacts, um, or by increasing the adaptive capacity of a resource. And so we've decided to um, tackle this second phase of our project through the use of our advisory council. And every uh, National Marine Sanctuary has an advisory council, which is like a stakeholder group of people that are already invested and um, really uh, involved in um, sanctuary, um, not necessarily management, but providing advice to management. And so they are already very involved in the issues that are, are facing our marine protected area. And so, um, what we'll be doing is asking the advisory council if they would form a working group in order to accomplish two things. And that would be to define distinct climate scenarios for um, our region. And then using those scenarios and the uh, results from the vulnerability assessments to then provide adaptation recommendations to sanctuary management. Um, and so, some of you may be familiar with scenario planning, but it's really an effective way of dealing with uncertainty in climate change. Um, some of these climate factors, we don't even yet know the direction of change, let alone the magnitude of change. And so this is a way of incorporating uncertainty into the planning process and preventing uncertainty from um, stalling action, because we know that we want to do something. Um, and so we really do, we have to address the elephant in the room, which is how, how certain are we that any of this is really going to happen. Um, and so the basic idea, if you want to learn more about scenario planning, there's a couple really great guides out. This figure was taken from Scenario Planning for Climate Change Adaptation. And it was um, the results of a scenario planning um, exercise that took place in Marin County. And so the basic gist of, of this process is for a group of people to come up with the most uncertain and the most impactful drivers of change. So um, which climate change factors are we really the least certain about? And which climate change factors do we know will have the greatest impact on our region? And you take those, those drivers of change, those climate change factors, and you kind of cross them to come up with multiple plausible futures. And so what this group did is they looked at the onset of the dry season, either being earlier or later than current, and they looked at the direction of the strong wind as either being more easterly or more northerly. And so they came up with four different and distinct scenarios that they could then use as a launching board for um, the rest of their adaptation planning exercises. And so based on the scenarios that the group will develop, they'll then use the vulnerability information to um, come up with uh, potential management actions to reduce the vulnerability of our resources. And um, we want them to develop those, 
evaluate them and prioritize them. And then that working group will then take their recommended actions back to the Sanctuary Advisory Council, who will um, either who will hopefully approve those and send those on to the sanctuary superintendent. Um, from this point, the information will take two different routes. Um, one of those is to make that information available to all of our partners, to all of the management agencies in the region, um, to encourage them to consider those management strategies and to possibly implement those um, from, their own, from their own management agencies. The second route is an internal process just for Gulf of Farallon National Marine Sanctuary. And we'll plan on drafting um, an implementation plan based on those um, recommended actions. And this plan would include um, strategy prioritization and a schedule of, of when and how we plan to implement those strategies, um, estimated cost of implementation and potential funding sources, as well as participating partners. And we plan to kind of organize this, this implementation plan into um, near-term, mid-term, and long-term actions. And so to kind of wrap all of that up into a timeline for this project, so you can get a sense of um, where we are and where we're headed. Um, earlier this year, we, had, we held those decision support workshops. We're now in the thick of writing the vulnerability assessment report. Um, and we hope to have those completed and reviewed um, sometime this fall so that we can have a completed uh, summary report for phase one that includes all of the vulnerability assessment information by the end of the year. Simultaneously, we'll be starting on um, getting the working group going. Um, we'll actually be asking the council to form a working group at their August meeting, so in just a couple weeks. And then over the fall, putting that group together and um, hopefully holding the first meeting of that working group at the beginning of the uh, new year. And then they'll um, immediately launch into scenario planning and probably spend the bulk of the year um, in the adaptation planning. And then by about March 2016, we're hoping to have that implementation plan complete as well as a summary report for all of phase two um, that kind of walks through the process that we use. Um, because we definitely want this, this whole process to be highly transferable to other regions in case someone else wants to come along and do something similar. Um, they can look at what we've done in our results and that information will hopefully be very helpful. So that is our project in a nutshell and I do encourage um, any of you to contact me um, at any point in the future if you have any further questions or want to learn more. Um, of course, we'll have plenty of time here for question and answer. Um, but I did want to circle back, since this is a, a webinar series focused on MPAs, um, to kind of a more broad context of, um, because for many of the reasons that I mentioned at the start of this presentation, adaptation planning can really be highly effective in marine protected areas. Um, because we already have partners and public that are generally pretty engaged. Um, science and monitoring is, is typically already taking place, and that can inform this process and be really useful. And then there are also resources that already exist that can be leveraged to um, get this work done, because it's no easy feat to go through this process. And as I mentioned earlier, EcoAdapt is really the brains behind these methods, and so I did want to plug them. Um, their website is below if you're interested in learning more about the work that they do. Um, they're a really great organization to work with and um, really helped us to develop a, a sound and feasible um, project. And they've also um, successfully applied these methods to many other systems, lots of terrestrial systems, um, but also some marine areas including the Florida Keys um, Reef Tract System. And so all that information is on their website if you um, are interested in learning more. And so, of course, please visit our website as well for the sanctuary if you want to learn any more about our climate program in general. Um, we also have information about our adaptation project there. And um, I just thank you for your time and would love to take any questions that you might have. Um, and I hope Kelly and Maria are on the line now that they can also um, participate. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah.
So uh, this is Lauren Wenzel again from the MK Center. I'm going to go ahead and read off some of the questions that have been sent in via the webinar. And uh, I will definitely encourage folks who have questions to go ahead and type those in, and we'll go ahead and get started on this. Just a process issue, someone's asked, if we'll, uh, can we share a copy of the presentation? The answer is yes. We always put a copy of the presentation both on the MPA Center website and then a recording of the webinar, for those who missed it, um, on the Open Channels site. So you will um, be able to check that in the next day or two and get access to those. So just going through some of these questions, here's one from uh, Stephen Midgley who's asking, um, Relating to goal setting, how do you deal with the issue of dynamic ecosystems? And if the climate is changing, how can you set biodiversity goals for individual species? That's a really great question um, because one tenet of, of us trying to be climate smart is that we're forward looking and we're not necessarily looking to restore um, ecosystem um, composition necessarily or to retain specific species. Um, we're really looking to enhance ecosystem function. And so if that means embracing a different suite of species for one of our habitats in order to keep that habitat functional um, and to retain that habitat's integrity, then that is, is really what's reflected in our goal. And so there's a reason the word restoration isn't really anywhere in our goal. It was at one point, and then we kind of realized, you know, that's not um, really forward-looking. Of course, um, the challenge comes in if, as a management agency, if you're mandated to protect specific species, then um, that's kind of a different story. And so that will take, I think, a little more um, internal discussions within your agency or organization. Um, but for the most part, we're really looking to um, integrate those projected changes, the species, how the species ranges might change, how their tolerances might change, um, and to try to embrace that and really um, um, incorporate that into our, our planning process. Okay. So there are a couple of questions here about who has been involved in your process. One about uh, NOAA fisheries and whether they have been involved with respect to their essential fish habitat process and also um, regional ocean planning and coastal tribes as all uh, individuals and agencies that have a great stake in these issues. Um, so we have not had any participation from coastal tribes. Um, I might defer to Kelly or Maria that know more about our region, whether that would be relevant for our project or not. Um, and then as far as fisheries, we have had some involvement from um, NOAA fisheries folks as far as getting us information for our vulnerability assessments, um, finding participants that have the time to devote two full days to our vulnerability assessment workshop is really difficult. Um, and they aren't uh, a specific partner on our project planning committee, but we have had um, some kind of offline discussions with them to gather more information for some of our specific species. Um, Kelly or Maria, do you guys have anything to add on the coastal tribe situation? Um, I, I'm not sure if we have Maria. Uh, she's having a few kind of audio issues. Maria, are you on the, <laughs> on the line? Yes, I'm here. Great. Okay. Um, one thing that I could just add briefly is uh, in terms of the process of developing, um, uh, bringing together a working group and developing the adaptation actions um, in, in thinking about the makeup of that working group since the um, project does extend up through Point Arena, more so that Sonoma County uh, kind of area and coastline is where there, there are uh, more kind of tribal, tribal representation in that area. Uh, the rest of the, the sanctuary doesn't have uh, quite as much or, or quite as active. And so um, I, I would see that being appropriate to um, have some tribal representation on that working group. And I don't know if, Maria, if you would want to add to that as well. Um, no, um, there, just, there aren't a lot of tribes in um, the existing Gulf Islands in the expansion area. There's tribes that are more inland. But uh, as Kelly said, we would be interested in, um, in engaging them in the future. OK, thanks. So another question. Uh, 
is there a written report reflecting the details of what the project has accomplished so far, for example, write-ups about the habitat vulnerability assessments? Um, not yet, so there will be. And um, so basically our plan for the fall is, is we're still in, in the writing phase for each of the resources um, to put together these assessment reports. Um, once we do have those finished and peer-reviewed, those are going to be a part of a larger document that goes through the methodology of um, the, the selection of the focal resources as well as the methodology for the assessments themselves and um, the process that was used. So that document will have all of our um, assessment results and summary documents as well as um, more of the, the process and methodology portion. And Sarah, what's your timing on that document again? Um, we're, our goal is to get that completed um, probably late fall, okay. November, December, and basically end of the year, yeah. Okay, and then you had mentioned peer review. There's a question about whether the climate scenarios were peer reviewed, um, for example, using regional and cl global climate models. Um, so that may be a better question for Kelly. She was involved in the development of the impact report, which is where we pulled a lot of our um, projected climate impacts from to be kind of the science foundation for this adaptation process. Um, so Kelly, do you, can you add anything to that? Uh, yes, and that, that document did go through um, IFI peer review. Um, and yes, so each, each of the, the documents that we have kind of produced thus far have um, first been produced by a working group of scientific experts, and then from there have gone through a, um, a, a, another peer review process with uh, experts that were not serving on the, on the working group as well. Um, and so, yes, we, we are trying to be, um, you know, scientifically uh, rigorous in, in our process here as well. Okay. I have a question here from Sarah Allen who's asking about um, why biodiversity is scored as only moderate in ecosystem services and wondering if you could explain a little bit more about the scoring and whether there was weighting in the scoring process. So there is not any weighting in the scoring process. We have um, discussed with EcoAdapt and they're going to kind of play around with the numbers a little bit um, and try a few different other methods of analysis for us because um, we felt that sensitivity and adaptive capacity, it may be helpful for those to be weighted um, slightly over exposure. Um, so that's something that we're looking at. The specifics of a resource and why it was scored and how it was scored, I can't really speak to right now. I'd have to go back and kind of comb through all of our documents. Um, so I could follow up with Sarah Allen about that later. And um, also, if, if folks are interested, um, in reviewing any of these documents, then that's that's something that we can we can do as well. Especially Sarah Allen, she's on our project planning committee. So Sarah, I'll follow up with you. Okay, and another question from Liz Trineski, who's asking: um, To what extent is this methodology being adopted across the sanctuary program? Is there interest in broader adoption? And also, do the vulnerability assessment and scenario planning processes include acid acidification, ocean acidification? Excuse me. Yes, ocean acidification is um, definitely a major stressor that's being considered. Um, and we really, from the outset, we wanted this project not just to focus on one climate impact, like sea level rise, for example. We wanted um, a very uh, holistic look at how we can expect climate change to impact our resources. And so in order to do that, we wanted to consider every <coughs> potential climate and non-climate stressor. So, um, Decreased pH is definitely being highly considered. Um, as far as sanctuary-wide implementation, um, not that I'm aware of. I believe there's interest, um, but Maria and Kelly, if, if you guys want to add anything to that, you may know a little more or have an idea of where that might be headed in the future. Yep, so within the sanctuary program, the Gulf of Fairlands um, has taken a leadership role in addressing climate change uh, and have been sharing our methodologies with other sites. Um, and it's up to the other site whether they choose to take on the issue of climate change or not. And we have had interest in um, other sanctuaries implement certain portions of the climate change um, initiative we're working on. All of us are required to become climate 
smart at some point. Um, so I would imagine that most sanctuaries would engage in this type of process in the future. So related to that, I wanted to follow up and note that I think a lot of other MPA programs might be very interested in this, but obviously you all have devoted and, and been successful in getting additional resources to fund this kind of process. Do you have any advice or comments for other programs that may not have those kinds of resources about how to make a start on the process like this? It's very, it's very difficult. Kelly, do you want to start on that? Yeah, I mean, grant, grant writing is a large part of uh, both Sarah and I, um, of, of the work that we do. So um, it really, and even uh, establishing a climate program at the sanctuary, um, we did need to do that without the addition of, um, or without any additional uh, funds added to our base but our base budget, um, there is, you know, kind of a small amount that could be allocated, but not um, not enough to actually run the program. And so we work in partnership with our association, the Fairlawns Marine Sanctuary, the, the Fairlawns Marine Sanctuary Association, um, to to have to to seek um, additional funds to to really be able to um, implement the climate program there. So. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just something a large part of um, the work that we do is really uh, soliciting and applying for um, for grants that that you know are kind of specific to the to the work that we're doing. So in terms of um, just recommendations or advice on how to get started, I think one of the key um, the key for us was is having partnerships and working through our advisory council, our other federal partners, and joining together um, to address the different issues of climate change. That is a key to our success. And that can be done um, with existing resources to a certain point. And then once you have that partnership, other, um, you know, other resources come available. There's just you have more exposure to them, more access to them, and you can pull resources from different um, groups. And that's what we've done. It's really been not just us, but our partners bringing in funds, um, staffing, support, uh, meeting rooms. So it is a, it's a team effort in the region. Yeah. Okay, thank, thanks for that. Okay, so there are some questions getting more back to the science and the technical side. Uh, there's a request from Megan Hepner. Can you go back over the axes of the vulnerability table? It seems like it includes two criteria on one axis and one on the other. Yeah, so um, sensitivity and exposure were averaged for, um, for the x-axis. So yeah, you're right. There's two kind of two different scores that are considered um, in that axis. And so that does technically give more weight to the adaptive capacity component if you're um, looking at this data visualization as a way to prioritize. Um, this is kind of what, how EcoAdapt has decided to <coughs> um, visualize the data. And so we are working with them to maybe come up with different ways um, to do that. But as I, as I mentioned earlier, when we are considering the resources and how we may prioritize um, our management strategies or actions, we're going to be looking um, kind of at those raw vulnerability scores. Um, and these are very categorical, the presentation here. And so um, we'll probably have a few <clears throat> different scores that maybe weight some of these components differently to consider. And all of that will be taken into consideration along with, of course, um, what we dig up through the literature and through peer review. All right. Um, there's a question here from Andy Smith, uh, again, about the, um, the scoring was surprised to see that estuaries are shown as having a relatively high adaptive capacity. Can you talk a little bit about how estuaries would be expected to respond to rising sea levels? Um, that's a really great question. And if I, if I could dig up kind of what our workshop participants had noted, then I could speak to that. I don't want um, to speak from my own ideas if they're not reflected by the folks that actually uh, provided this information to come up with the score. Um, but our assessment report that we're developing for each resource will definitely delve into um, 
kind of the context for this scoring and uh, background information that may that may support and may not support the scoring. Um, just in in some of the ones that I've I've started researching and written already, um, you know, sometimes the group of folks that you have providing this information, um, they may not know about um, a few recent studies that that may actually say something differently. So um, all of this will be incorporated into kind of our summary assessment. Um, but as far as any specific uh, examples right now I can't really speak to. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Marla Stelk asking, how do you account for tipping points when you uh, get to the point of mm -hmm. no recovery? Um, that's a really great question and I don't know that I have um, a good answer for that. Kelly or Maria, do you guys have anything to add about tipping points? That's kind of a tough one. I guess they don't have anything to add. Um, and so maybe that's something that um, I address with our reviewers um, specific to some of these processes that do that we that we do expect to see having tipping points. Um, so I'll make note of that. That's a great point. Thank you. I think okay. that will probably come out when we do our um, scenario planning. That's true. That's another opportunity for it to be addressed, yeah. A uh, question from Jack Leapster asking, have you done any spatial inventory maps of the susceptible resources? So um, I assume that he's kind of referring to um, something like a sea level rise map that shows that specific vulnerability um, specific to, to different locations in our region. And um, a lot of that information will be incorporated throughout the process. Um, Kelly, do you have any any ideas on that? Um, no, I mean it's something that we can consider incorporating, uh, more so incorporating right. into the final report, um, but it's not uh, something that we do have uh, some resources, you know, already in the in our region here that we could utilize for that. But it's not something that we have done at this point. And I think that that may come out um, when we're actually developing on the ground management actions or strategies. If we're, um, you know, because right now we're kind of talking about, for example, estuaries very generally across our entire region. Um, we're not specifically talking about one particular estuary um, at any given moment when we're doing these assessment reports. And so that may be something that would be more relevant and useful further um, into the project when we're actually looking at specific management actions that can be taken. And just wanted to add that Megan also replied that there's going to be a tipping point climate threshold workshop in Charleston in a couple of weeks and that they can oh. provide some feedback based on that workshop too. Oh great, okay. I'll make note of that. Uh, so another uh, comment from Patrick Christ at saying, great presentation on the process. Can you describe any specific technical tools that were used to support this work? Um, you know, we didn't really incorporate very many technical tools um, at this point. This is, this is more, it's kind of more of a qualitative um, information gathering process where we're, we're trying to bring together um, the regional experts in these in these resources um, to use kind of each other and their expertise to, to indicate to us how they feel the vulnerability of these resources may be changing and what we can expect. Um, I, we have considered turning to more technical tools like um, the invest models that natural capital um, is using. That is a challenge for us, having the technical expertise and the resources to incorporate some of those more technical tools into this project. Um, and it's still something that we're considering and, and keeping our eye on. And um, we may pursue, if it comes out during this process, that um, we need um, some kind of more um, quantitative data to back some of this up or to help us move forward in this process. So I hope that answers your question. And I think technical tools will be brought in during the adaptation strategy um, portion of this when we're dealing with the working group and mm -hmm. in those tools to, to look more closely at individual habitats and um, potential impacts. I agree, yeah. 
Okay, well, it's 2 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. I did want to note that um, one of our participants has asked Megan if she can please share the information about the Tipping Point Conference, a web address or a contact person. So uh, if you can send that to Sarah or me, that would be great. And mostly I just want to thank our presenter and uh, the other uh, folks from Gulf of the Fair Loans who participated. Um, Maria and Kelly, thank you very much. Uh, great presentation, and it sounds like we're going to have to invite you back in another year to, to give us an update on where this is all going. That would be wonderful. Thank you, Lauren. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Yes.